you have to be really good at denying. And so let's just go ahead and start. We are really in an, an island right now in turmoil. Um, and we're talking about not just our island, if you look at what's happened and been shared in the media, nationally, internationally, in the social media, some of the things that are coming up that are being written about Guam, about the people on Guam, about the Chamorro people, is quite painful to read. And so, you know, how, how do any of you know what I'm talking about? Social media? Yeah, so there's some very negative comments being made about us as a people by people who don't really understand. And what kind of emotions do you have? Nothing? You don't feel anything when you read something or hear something disparaging about the people of Guam? Anger. Anger. Bitterness. Bitterness. Frustration. Frustration. Okay. And, you know, we have threats. We were just, just a couple weeks ago, last week, we experienced a sense of, did anybody feel fear about the imminent threat to Guam? And then some people, did you feel like you were safe because you're on an American territory? No. The other part is that it's familiar to people. It's not new. There's something wrong with it being not new, that we would be attacked. And so they're telling us if, if within 14 minutes we would be attacked. Our beautiful island. What's this? The Twin Towers. Raise your hand if you remember what you were doing and where you were at when you heard about these series of events. And where did it hit you? Was it just a story in the paper? Most people, it was very visceral. Why? Because that too was familiar. We know what it's like to be attacked. We know what it's like to suffer. Much of America doesn't know. They've never been attacked. Many people have never experienced an event such as this, or a series of events within a very short period of time. And so I'm going to give you a frame of reference because that helps. I was born in 1954. I was four years old at this time. And at this time, do you think I heard very much and as I got older about the war? Do you think so? This goes back to um, Hope Cristobal's question. No, in some families, and they're within group differences. Within group difference means that within the Chamorro culture, there are many different levels of identity and cultural affinity. And so some people are very American, some people are, so there's a whole range of, of um, experiences. This was 14 years after the war the end of our war. But this is the part that's really important to remember as we move through this, and I'm going to be moving quickly, is that throughout history we survived and we've adapted. That's why we still exist in spite of centuries of trying to control or even eliminate us. Now, the word adaptive means that you adjust your behavior so that you can survive. You develop coping mechanisms. You develop defensive behaviors. But we've not always adapted very well. You ever heard of the word maladaptive? It's something that we did that made sense at the time. But as time passed, it no longer makes sense and is actually destructive. And so for some families, some individuals, they develop maladaptive experiences. And so that begs the question, why is this topic important? We have the highest suicide rate among the youth and the young adults. We know that. I can see many of you here might know. Alcoholism, alcoholism substance abuse, family violence, high crime rate. We're disproportionately represented 
the Chamorro people are disproportionately represented in either DYA or DOC. A dependence on public assistance and a growing belief of the loss of our culture, language, and our future as a people. So let's think, think about that a little bit. These are the experiences that many of you just talked about and more. People say, why don't they raise their hands? Why don't they stand up and argue? Why don't they, why are they so sad? Why are they, why are they? The question is, why are we? And so when we look at the picture on the left, this is how it's depicted. We had an organized society and this is our picture, kind of the people today. That's my family. And so you're here to understand trauma and its effects on people, but no, no, not just people. We're talking about the community. We're talking about the collective. How does this affect us? So let's talk first, let's, let's unpack what PTSD is. So each of you who, ha who know people, who heard stories, when Mr. Bloss was talking about why did it take so long for people to tell their stories? Now, if you experience rape, if you experience an assault, if you experience war trauma, like you went to Africa, or you went to Iraq, or Afghanistan, or you had a home invasion, you would have all kinds of emotions, and you may be willing to talk. But if it's rape, if it's a family, are you willing to talk? That's hard, because there are, there's shame that we could have done something different. So the development of PTSD are really a series of symptoms, and it's, it's elicited by a direct personal experience of an event involving actual or threatened death. It's a threat to one's physical integrity, their body, and witnessing death, injury, or threat to the physical integrity of another person, and learning about the unexpected or violent death of someone. So it doesn't even have to be something you witnessed. If you have a close connection to somebody, you can, like when you're reading the stories, when you're hearing someone's story, it elicits all kinds of emotions. Serious harm or injury experienced by a family member or someone that you closely associate with. Now, Ruth is a Filipino psychologist in Washington and she talks about direct trauma. That's kind of what we were just talking about. It's direct, it happens to someone. Indirect is when it's when a people are devalued, when they're put down by those in power, you experience trauma indirectly, just as some of you were talking about earlier. Um, and these, these experiences can persist throughout a lifetime and have what we call a cumulative effect. It's not just one thing, it's multiple things that kind of get packed together and then you carry it around with you. Insidious trauma is the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And so let's talk about this next slide, because this is the one that's, that really helped me understand what's happened to Guam. This, Duran and Duran in 1955, they're indigenous Native Americans, and they talked about the soul wound as an indigenous people who have undergone um, a violent or oppressive colonization, not just in a short time, but over centuries. And so what happens is that they internalize or identify with their oppressors. I'll say that again. They become more like the oppressor. They become agents of the oppressor. Okay? And so their self-image, and as a group, you sink to a level of, basically, you're a sellout. You become associated so much that you, you lose track of who you are as an individual, a family, and so forth. So how does this affect us is that we have externalized self-hatred. It manifests in anger and violence, and get this, against your family member 
Why? Because your family can forgive you. They may be crying. That's like the battered woman syndrome. You beat them up, you yell at them, but they, for, they, they feel that you can forgive them. So, but, you know, you pack it up and then you go to work and you're fine. But you go home and you rage against the kids. Internalized self-hatred is manifests itself in suicide. Enough already. Depression, despair, anxiety, fear. And then, you know, even after a really bad, bad day at work, some of you might even say, Lani, it's... I can't wait to have that beer or that glass of wine. What more when it's a story in your head, a feeling, and so you withdraw? And on top of that is that you want to, like, not think about it. Okay? So the intergenerational transmission of historic community trauma is the cumulative effect over time. And we develop these maladaptive behaviors to cope. And this is unresolved. Whatever created that. You see, when I work with, with rape victims, child or adults, work with them, hold them, listen to their story, but the ultimate goal, as what's happened with the church right now, is that it's empowering to say it happened to me. I don't want you to see my face, but I want my story told. That's part of the healing process. That's part of saying it's real. It happened. And so the people who suffered the experience of the, the church, I don't want to kind of like set myself up for another topic, is that the process of bringing them to court, just like the rape victim. I talk to a little girl and say, you just talk to the judge. You don't have to sit in the courtroom. You'll go to the office in the back. And you tell the judge what happened. But if you don't tell the story, guess what? It gets passed on. So when I work with a rape victim, especially a child, I look at the mom and I say, how old were you when, when you were raped? Or when you were molested? And they look at me like, and they just like bawl. And they bawl because, how did you know? It's because it happened to me. I'm ashamed to talk about it. And you pass it on. So telling the story is very important. We listen to our elders, yes. And this is how wisdom is passed on. But it's also how these maladaptive behaviors, these thoughts, are passed on. So when I was growing up, I didn't hear stories about the war, you know, and as I got older, I would read the paper, but they were like the same stories by the same storyteller. That it happened to them, but I was thinking like, Lani, aren't there other people who were here? And that goes back to how very few people were willing to come forward. Why? Because you revealed too much. It's so painful to tell a story especially one that, that was so visceral. And we'll go on. Um, moving on. The effects on parenting, unresolved anger, little things set them off, especially at home. Dad comes home or mom comes home, they're like, oh, you know, we don't want to say anything. What do you do? You be silent. You behave. And you follow all the rules. And then some people, do not believe that they are capable as others. Uh, so they don't strive for more. And that's kind of like the learned hap helplessness. There's also dependence, hopelessness, and may even lead to suicide. Now, people with, exist within a context. Each of you go home, you work, you have relationships. Those are all contexts. Indigenous societies relied on the oral retelling of stories and chanting. We are, are an oral, we are, our bases, our, our lives, and the stories are made from the stories that have been passed on over the generations and the generations. That's how, if you know what it's like to be Chamorro, and I ask people, what does that mean? It comes from the stories. 
Regardless of whether the retelling of the story evokes an emotional response, if individuals within that culture strongly identify with one another, the evocative stories get passed on. Gledding talks about the ne negative effects of trauma. The cultural stories, unresolved traumatic events, are passed on from generations and generations. So, moving on, our stories give me have meaning. And these meanings are inseparable from the stories themselves. So if the story is horrific for me, do you think I want to be talking about it all the time? No. Do I want to expose my, my children to it? Most likely not. Do I want to share with the community? Oh, that's hard. What they did to that woman. Why? Because that's human. People will share the stories, but they don't necessarily understand the context. So to reveal oneself within a small community like Guam leaves you open to what? I not allow. So that let it go. A matapeng asanga You know what I mean? It's these are things that within the culture you're not supposed to say. You're not supposed to reveal. Now, I remember my awakening happened when I was taking a history of Guam course, and my professor was Dr. Underwood. And you know, here I am sitting kind of excited, university, this young professor, and we go around and we tell our names. And I said, oh, what's your name? Oh, see, my name's Patty. And he looks at me and he says, huh? Your name's Patricia. And I was like, I could hear in the back of my head, Patricia! You know? <laughs> it was like, oh, I don't want to be yelled at. <laughs> but he says, no, you need to use it. You need to wear it. You need to claim it. That's your name. Patty, Pat, those are like either people who love me can call me Patty. But Pat, you know, what's Pat? Lani, Pat, your butt, what? So he awoken me to this idea that I was taking on something that was not given to me. My name was Patricia, and I need to own it, except for the people who love me. So it was really this book, 1982. How many of you read this book? So we read the history books, and we hear about our stories, about the, what was described by, about the war, but this book just like blew me away because this I could relate to. This was a man who was not in Guam, but his mom was married to an American man. His children were of mixed heritage and she was killed. And as he grew up, he said, I need to understand what happened. He came back and he unpacked. He researched it. And the reading of the story was really the first part that said, oh, the books are, also, the history books are so sterile. You don't get the feel. If you haven't read this, it's a really good read. Painful. Honest, true. And so when we think about what we're doing here, uh, Frank Bloss Jr. talks about the greatest generation being able to share the, uh, their stories about the suffering that they experience, witness, all the heroism. We don't hear so much about that. The things that they did. And they, they, they don't tell their stories to get attention and so forth. Moving right along, it's very important that we allow ourselves to tell our stories, that we listen to the stories as they're told. We just had the Tsiguian uh, lecture this morning. I heard it was very powerful. I'm sorry. But there are other massacres. And even these massacres, they're huge, and a larger number of people. But throughout the island, there were small incidences within homes, outside on the streets of stories.
and then more people telling their stories. Stories that are getting documented. This is powerful. You want to listen, you want to encourage, you provide a place of safety for people to tell their stories.